Good evening. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is away. Tonight, heartbreaking details in a terrible discovery. Toronto police say the body found in a dumpster was a little girl. Our first priority now is to establish the identity of this little girl. Who was she? Who left her there? Also tonight, a CBC News exclusive. A Canadian shares his experience fighting in Ukraine. I have one word to describe and it's, it's just hell. Politics and promises when it comes to abortion. At issue is here. And the pandemic popularity of pickleball. It doesn't use a racket, but some complain it sure makes one. This is The National. It was a startling and horrific discovery to begin with. A body left in a Toronto dumpster. Well, tonight it seems an unthinkable tragedy. Police confirm the body was a little girl. The urgent questions now, who was she? Where did she come from? How did she end up there? Ali Chiasson has the story. The autopsy has confirmed it was a little girl in that bin. Possibly between the ages of four to seven years, the child is described as black, of African, or mixed African descent. She is three feet, six inches tall with a thin build. She was wrapped in a crochet blanket inside of a plastic bag. That bag was wrapped in a colorful blanket. Police say someone put her there just a few days before a construction worker discovered the remains on Monday. But the autopsy reveals she had been dead for much longer. She may have been deceased as early as last summer or fall, 2021 or perhaps earlier. Our first priority now is to establish the identity of this little girl. The missing persons unit is scouring databases both locally and across Canada. We've looked at some outstanding missing persons occurrences. There are a couple which come close, but none that strike us right now as, as definitely being the one. It's not yet clear how she died or whether it was murder, but... Homicide is actively involved in this investigation, and the investigative mindset, uh, as you know, is kids don't just, don't, don't just die. There are many security cameras in this area, but none that are exactly fixed on the driveway where the dumpster was. So Toronto police will be scouring through days worth of footage from several different cameras from around here to try to catch a glimpse of the suspect or suspects who might have driven the body here, walked by here, or even taken transit. The subway station is just five minutes away. Until a cause of death is determined, if any charges were to be laid, it's for indignity to a dead body. That can escalate to murder very quickly. For anyone who recognizes the blanket or victim description to please call us immediately. We will identify this little girl and we will be doing all the work that we can for her. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. A young woman accusing singer Jacob Hogard of sexually assaulting her as a teen testified today at the trial of the former Headley frontman. She testified that she had come to know Hogard as a super fan of the band. In court, she said he had encouraged her to share sexually explicit texts with him when she was 15 years old. Before her testimony, the Crown laid out its case in an opening statement accusing Hogard of violently raping today's witness as well as another woman. Hogard has pleaded not guilty to the charges. To the war in Ukraine now, where civilians trapped in Mariupol are caught in the crossfire, and efforts to get them out have again been derailed by fighting. <laughs> Hundreds of civilians have escaped Mariupol after a second convoy made it out. We do hope that this operation will continue. But instead, attacks resumed. Both sides blame the other for breaking the ceasefire. This commander says he expects his Russian forces will conquer the Azov-style industrial complex in time for May 9th, Victory Day in Russia. But elsewhere, Ukraine isn't playing to that script. Near Kharkiv, it's on the counterattack, taking villages back. Russia's offensive in the east is brutal and relentless, but some say it's also stalled. First-hand accounts of what that fight is actually like are rare. But today, David Common met a Canadian volunteer fighter who's seen it and barely lived to tell the tale. It's, it's just hell. Yeah, hell. 
This is the frontline story of shadow, a nom de guerre for a former Canadian soldier fighting in Ukraine. His first patrol is north of Kiev as the invasion begins. It was uh, to go into a apartment building and set up a sniper position from there. His partner, a noted Canadian sniper named Wally. Ten minutes after, huge explosion. So we just got hit by a tank and then we got out of the, the building and then after that, huge firefight. We had the Russians, they were like 50 meters from us, uh, bullets flying everywhere. A Ukrainian soldier gets hit. Bleeding everywhere and just like, and he kept running and stuff. He says they managed to get to a van shooting their way out. And that was our first, our first patrol, our first mission. From there, it just got worse, worse, yeah. Frontline, baby. That worse is the east, where fighting is fiercest now. The vibe was like World War II. It's like rain, mud, fields, um, trenches. Their job, with one Javelin anti-tank missile, take out a Russian tank. Uh, so Wally looked at me and he said, can you just stay in, in, in the trench? And I was like, all right, man, you know, like it's pretty boring to just sit in a trench. Just as he was getting out. Huge explosion. Uh, so I fell in the trench on, on my back and I look, I see one of my friends dead, isn't, isn't it moving? And then I looked uh, to the other one. He was like j just a couple of feet uh, from me. And then he was still breathing, but no legs. He didn't have any legs. And then we made eye contact. I looked at him. He looked at me. So he just like passed away in front of my eyes. That was his last oh, patrol. Enough. After two months of fighting, he's stepping back to do humanitarian work. Because every day you're getting casualties, every day you're getting your friends getting killed, and it's days after, after days. It was just going to recover dead bodies of our friends that, that were killed in action from their previous patrol. Shadow says his family back in Quebec is worried, but he feels supported. He wishes Ukraine felt the same. David Common, CBC News, Lviv, Ukraine. Now we've agreed not to use Shadow's real name. Foreign fighters often go by pseudonyms to protect themselves and their families from retaliation. You can watch our full interview with Shadow online at cbcnews.ca. After more than two years of living with COVID-19, the world is getting a clearer picture of the toll the pandemic has taken. And the number is staggering. The World Health Organization says nearly 15 million people have died as a result of the pandemic. Their deaths either directly or indirectly related to the virus. That is far higher than the official number of COVID-19 deaths reported. Beyond the terrible human toll, experts say there's much to learn from the data. And as Christine Birak explains, it could help save lives in the future. The sheer number of lives lost in this pandemic is overwhelming. Officially, countries have reported nearly 5.5 million COVID deaths, but the World Health Organization estimates the overall toll is nearly three times higher. We have to remember that behind these numbers are people. As part of their study, researchers calculated excess deaths, the difference between the number of deaths that have occurred and the number that would be expected if there were no pandemic. And there's more. Excess deaths include deaths directly and or indirectly attributable to COVID-19. Which includes people who were unable to access care for other conditions due to overwhelmed health care systems. At a global level, the big story is very much India. While the Indian government denies it, data scientists say about half of all excess deaths were likely in India, which is backed up by a Canadian study that conducted phone polls in India asking people about deaths in their family. Of the 10 million deaths that occur a year, 3 million simply aren't registered. Just nothing. Every government 
needs to learn what to do better. Experts insist WHO's data offers a global picture of lessons learned. Numbers can reveal where and what interventions saved lives, which can inform public health policies for the future. It's a whole lot of deaths that could have been avoided if we were able to mount a better response. Within days, the U.S. is expected to reach a staggering milestone. One million reported deaths from COVID-19. Here at home, that number is closer to 40,000. Experts say excess death data helped reveal problems in long-term care. And comparisons with other countries and between provinces could offer even more insight into how lives could be saved. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. During the 2020 Nova Scotia mass shooting manhunt, another chaotic scene was unfolding. Two police officers mistakenly shot at a fire hall with civilians inside. Today, the inquiry examining the manhunt heard from those officers for the first time publicly. Kayla Hounsell brings us their testimony and the reaction from victims. The Onslow Belmont Fire Hall was being used as a comfort center when it became the source of trauma shot up by two police officers. I believed that I was firing my carbine at the killer. But they were mistaken. A real RCMP officer was in his car in the parking lot and caught in the confusion. <laughs> Who are you shooting at? The original two officers say they thought they had Gabriel Workman, who was in the midst of a killing spree. I believe that person was going inside the building to kill people. I knew we had to stop him. But it wasn't the gunman, rather an emergency management coordinator standing next to a police car wearing a high visibility vest. So while I'm yelling commands, uh, he ducks down. And at that point, I don't know if he's coming up again with a gun. At that time, the officers knew the shooter was driving a replica police cruiser and believed he was wearing an orange vest. Inside the fire hall, two firefighters were hiding. They previously testified they're still traumatized after being fired upon. To hear them continue to tell the same story that they've, they've told all along, um, you know, it, it just adds to the, to the anxiety. Both officers were previously cleared of any wrongdoing by Nova Scotia's independent police watchdog. They maintain, given the information they had, they wouldn't have done anything differently. On that day, I gave... <clears throat> I gave my all. I am sorry for what the firemen went through. It was a hard day for many people that day. The firefighters say the apology means nothing to them because it came two years too late. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. An Indigenous man and his granddaughter have reached a financial settlement with the Bank of Montreal over their public arrest in 2019 while trying to open a bank account in Vancouver. We're people too. And it's, 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 I don't think it's right that we have to prove who we are by carrying a status card. So I just want people to educate themselves more about First Nations issues and our culture. Bank staff called 911 to report alleged fraud after inspecting the IDs of Maxwell Johnson and his 12-year-old granddaughter, Tori Ann including their government-issued status cards. Speaking today from the very spot they were handcuffed, Johnson said he forgives the bank. Terms of the settlement were not disclosed. In Manitoba, severe flooding continues to ravage Fegwa's First Nation. Much of that community is now quite literally underwater. And at this crucial planting time, so are many farmers' fields. Here's Cameron McIntosh on what forecasters see in the days ahead. From the air, the chief of Pegwa's First Nation assessing the damage with federal officials. It's never been this high. This land here is never flooded. This is the first time. While on the ground, Suzanne Sinclair is trying to save her father's home. Like many here, just trying to avoid being forced out. Yeah, if we evacuated, he would be end up my, uh, <laughs> my roommate for a while until the house was fixed. 1,400 people have had to leave. Another 800 may soon follow as the federal government brings in more than 100 people to help with the flood fight, aided by the province in lieu of a formal request for the military. 
we work with communities to make sure that resources within Manitoba and within our resources within Indigenous Services Canada are exhausted first. South of Winnipeg along the Red River Valley's Highway 75, similar scenes. Dikes are being closed off as many farm fields look like lakes. Here along the Red River, water is being diverted around the city of Winnipeg, but not as much as initially feared. It now appears the Red River will crest earlier and lower than initially forecast. Peak level for the Red River at Merson uh, is going to come over the weekend. Still says the province's top flood forecaster, the water will stay high for most of May. It will take time for the water to come below the banks. In other words, those who aren't flooded by now likely won't be. But some roads, including the main highway to the U.S., will remain closed for a while. Instead of a tractor, the best way onto these fields is a sea -doo. Our cropping plan is out the window now. For Paul Saborin, it all limits options for getting a crop in. The corn, the sunflowers, the millet, all those crops are likely out the window now. So we are, uh, just have to alter our cropping plan. For Peguis, it's the third major flood in 12 years. It will be a while to fully assess all the damage. And for those that had to leave, maybe a long time coming back, even when the water drops. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Now to Ottawa, where tonight five of the six Conservative leadership candidates squared off in their first debate. Catherine Cullen has the highlights from a night of heated exchanges and what it all says about where the race might be heading. Have you mentioned each other? If you'd like to mix it up, let's go. And they did, attacking the presumed frontrunner. Well, I did stand up for freedom during the pandemic. From the very beginning, That's I was, not true. I was not among true. the loudest voices that You were not one of the loudest it voices. Leslin Lewis questioned whether Pierre Polyev was supportive enough of the anti-vaccine mandate convoy. Then she pressed him on abortion, which she opposes. Mr. Pierre Polyev has ran from the media the last few days because he doesn't want to declare whether he's pro-life or pro-choice. Polyev didn't respond to that remark, though he has said he supports access to abortion. We may not agree on all issues. It was clear Jean Charest's battle was happening in a not entirely friendly room. Mr. Poliev, during that period, supported an illegal blockade. Mr. You cannot Mr. make laws and break Mr. laws Charest. and but, then... But he plowed on. If I was able to fight back the separatists, it's not this guy here on the stage tonight that's going to intimidate me. Poliev had come prepared to hit back, challenging Charest about his work for Chinese telecom giant Huawei, while Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor were in jail in China. Mr. Charest, how much money did you get from Huawei when you were working for them, either directly or indirectly? Just the number, please. Yeah, Mr. Are Shreed. we talking about the company that Stephen Harper welcomed into Just Canada the number, please. How in much? 2012? How much, sir? The two other men on stage both made appeals for a better tone. And I don't think that attacking each other scorched earth is going to win us an election. If we put on a show that is divisive and, and nasty with each other, I, I just don't see how that unites all Conservatives. A message seemingly not embraced at the end of the night by two of the candidates. And the candidate who skipped the debate, Patrick Brown, was mocked for it. Now he has shown a particular desire to attack Pierre Polyev, meaning next Wednesday's official English language debate with all six candidates on stage, well, that could be even more fiery. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. There are more signs of U.S. financial instability after a bloodletting on Wall Street erased yesterday's big gains. The Dow plunged right at the opening bell and closed down over 1,000 points, its steepest one-day dive in two years. The S&P 500 and Nasdaq also closed down heavily. Analysts blame uncertainty over rising interest rates aimed at curbing inflation. Security is increasing outside the U.S. Supreme Court in Washington due to abortion rights demonstrations. Workers installed higher fences around the court late last night. Pro-choice and anti-abortion protesters have been gathering there since Monday when a draft decision that would strike down Roe v. Wade was made public. With potential abortion bans looming, some large corporations are promising to help employees through their benefits policies. Nisha Patel shows us which brands are stepping up and why they may be just the beginning. Americans are making their voices heard over abortion rights. 
And now the pressure's on companies to respond. I think they're inclined to be silent, but I don't think they're going to be able to be silent. It's a challenge for companies in the U.S. where health care is so tied to employment. If the U.S. Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade, pregnant people in more than 20 states face an abortion ban and would have to travel thousands of kilometers to access the procedure. Whether or not they provide abilities for you to travel or something like that really has an enormous effect on just the practical ability of, uh, of women to seek health care. A handful of companies said they would cover the costs of that travel. In order to safeguard employees and make sure that they can get the health care that they need no matter what state they live in, we need a benefit like this. While other industry leaders have yet to say anything. They're worried about blowback, particularly political blowback from uh, governments in the South. Just last month, banking giant Citigroup said it would pay for workers to travel to access abortions. In response, Republican lawmakers made moves to try to cancel Citigroup's government contracts. Nobody's asking companies to take a stance on when life begins. We are asking companies to acknowledge that this issue has workforce and economic impact. And amid growing public pressure. Companies are being told, you know, both by their employees and by their customers that they can't just say, oh, that's politics. You know, we're just about business anymore. If the Supreme Court does overturn Roe v. Wade, more companies may have to take a side. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. The Biden administration has a new White House press secretary. Karine Jean-Pierre will begin in a few weeks taking over from Jen Psaki. Jean-Pierre is the first black and openly gay person in the job. She has served as the deputy press secretary since Biden was elected. Residents living in Ottawa's affordable housing are speaking out about the horrible conditions. Black mold. Coming up, leaky ceilings and bed bugs. Why it's in such disrepair. Plus. This government has done nothing to expand access to abortion services. Party leaders are asked to take a stand on abortion rights, but where does that leave Canadians? Rosie's here with that issue. And... Pickleball is booming, but some are not happy about it. What the hell? We're back in two. CBC News, The National, named Canada's best national newscast at the Canadian Screen Awards. Welcome back. As housing becomes less affordable for many Canadians, the accessibility and livability of subsidized housing is critical. But experts say many units are chronically underfunded and poorly maintained. Nicole Williams takes us inside some Ottawa community housing units to see what some residents there have to deal with. I've been waiting four and a half years to get this done. This is Andrea Terry's kitchen. She says missing drawers are just the tip of the iceberg. And the one thing, black mold. From holes in the floors to holes in the walls and broken electrical outlets, Terry says her home and Ottawa Community Housing townhouse is falling apart and nothing is being done about it. I'm embarrassed to bring people here because of the lack of repairs that are getting done. Um, it's heartbreaking for me because I used to care. In another OCH townhouse across the city, a woman who we're calling Rhoda says her family has seen their fair share of problems ever since they moved in 10 years ago. CBC isn't using her real name and others in this story because of concerns about speaking out. My kid is all the, all the time they complain. The main source of those complaints, a leaky roof. She says the problem is so bad that in one of the bedrooms, water drips onto the bed whenever it rains or snows. Another room can't even be used in the winter because it gets so cold. And in some cases, there's mold. Sometimes they, you see the, the wall is wet in the inside the house. It's no good for us. Then there's the matter of bed bugs, which forces many of OCH's low-income tenants to throw out their precious belongings. This former tenant lived in a high-rise for about six years. At one point, bites covered her entire arm. Not being able to sleep at night or being worried that you're going to be crawled on and bitten. 
As for the conditions of OCH homes, that's an uphill battle for the corporation too. It's dealing with aging properties, many it inherited by the provincial government in the 1990s. The province itself, when it owned that part of the portfolio prior to 1999, uh, wasn't spending enough money on maintaining it well. OCH says it receives hundreds of thousands of maintenance requests a year. And even though it's challenging, they're a priority. As any landlord, we will fix the issue, make it, making sure that people are comfortable and safe in their homes. Many of the tenants we spoke to say that's not the reality. They understand that fixes take time, but say that even getting a verbal response from community housing staff is often difficult. Nicole Williams, CBC News, Ottawa. Next on The National, Rosie's here with that issue. Hi, Rosie. Hey, Adrian. Tonight we're going to get at the political conversation around abortion in this country, how Roe v. Wade is fueling questions on this side of the border for both the government and the opposition. Chantal, Andrew, and Althea will join me and all of us to talk about that and more. The U.S. Supreme Court's draft opinion on Roe v. Wade is playing out politically in Canada too, prompting questions to the government about inconsistent access to abortion services. This government has been in power for seven years and has done nothing to expand access to abortion services. We will never back down from protecting and promoting access to safe abortion in Canada and around the world. Interim Conservative leader Candace Bergen first asked her caucus not to comment on the draft ruling, later saying in a statement that the Liberals were the only ones reopening the abortion debate. But not everyone in her party agrees. I would gen generally say the debate's never been closed. So where does this leave the political conversation on abortion in this country? What does it mean for the Liberals and the Conservatives? It's Thursday. I'm here with At Issue. Chantelle Bear, Andrew Coyne and Althea Raj. El Amin is away this week. Althea, I'm going to start with you uh, in terms of what you made of the initial political response or I guess uh, delayed response in the case of the Conservatives. Um, I would say entirely predictable. Uh, this is an issue where we know what um, the challenges are uh, within the Conservative Party and we know that the Liberals are as um, eager as they always have been to exploit this issue. If you'll uh, recall the uh, abortion attestation uh, from the uh, Canada Student Jobs Funding from a few years ago. Um, I, that's not to take away from, I think, that the, there are many women across this country who fear that what is happening in the U.S., something similar could happen in this country in the sense that the issues are, are not the same. There is no right to an abortion, despite what the Liberals and the Prime Minister uh, say all the time. There is a, a vacuum, and within that vacuum, uh, it has meant that abortion is not criminalized. But uh, I think it's understandable for the Liberals to suggest that they, or at least as the Prime Minister said Wednesday, um, that they're exploring issues where they could uh, ensure that abortion services are not just protected under this government, but under future governments as well. Um, that being said, a lot of activists are concerned that if you um, legislate the right to abortion, that it would make it easier for, frankly, conservative MPs, because they're the only ones uh, suggesting this, to make it easier for them to restrict abortion. Andrew. Uh, as Althea said, it's not only predictable, we've seen this movie over and over again. Uh, it's true that the Liberals, in some senses, like to bring the issue up, up over and over again so as to make the Conservatives uncomfortable. But the fact that the Conservatives are uncomfortable kind of settles the issue for me. Uh, it, it, you know, what party is this that's going to propose legislation to restrict abortion? Uh, the reason the, the Conservatives are so uncomfortable is they can read the polls the same as anybody else, and it would be politically suicidal for them to do so. Uh, the Liberals, it, it is a double-edged sword for them at the same time because, mm -hmm. as Mr. Jagmeet Singh was uh, pointing out, they've been in power for seven years now. There are still the same issues surrounding access to abortion that there were when they came into power. Uh, Mr. Trudeau has been talking about let's we, maybe we'll bring in legislation that will make it impossible for any future government to restrict abortion. I'm not sure what he means, short of a constitutional amendment. But if you, if if there were any possibility of the Liberals. Uh, finally and, f and, f and, f and fully settling this issue, I don't think they'd take it because it would take away from them the, ish the ability to bring it up again and again to, to, to beat the Tories over the head with. So everyone's playing to the same uh, political incentives that they always have. Chantal. 
Yes, uh, an absent fact in uh, most instances. Uh, like Andrew, I don't believe that Justin Trudeau knows what he means by legislation. Should we have a law that says we have no law uh, on, on access to abortion? An interesting proposition, uh, if I ever heard one. As for the conservatives, the three main contenders for the conservative leadership, uh, and not just them, have said publicly, including Pierre Poilievre, that they are pro-choice. And yes, a third of the Conservative caucus hails from the other side of that discussion. But uh, have, the, the Conservatives were in power for 10 years under Stephen Harper, yeah. and nothing happened. So at some point, uh, to continue to say something is happening in the United States, so the boogeyman is coming for you, uh, kinds of get gets tired, and I think the notion of federal legislation that uh, Justin Trudeau alluded to is a way to try to bring it forward. But seriously, yes. uh, the people who provide abortion services in this country, the governments, are provincial governments. So if the federal government of the day wants to tell provinces sure. that they should do this for abortion, this for uh, health care, then they need a constitutional amendment, not on abortion. But to say that the federal government wants to reclaim competence over health care. Sure. I, I take your point around at some point you, you can't uh, wait for the boogeyman. But I, I think there would be women in the United States that might think as well, well, maybe this is settled. And, and then we let our guard down, uh, as did Democrats. And now we're facing this issue again. Chantal, and then I'll go through everybody again. Yes, but our system is different, or in case people are not keeping score, for instance, the majority on the Supreme Court of Canada is a Stephen Harper majority. That will be the case until next September. Uh, criminal code provisions, those that regulate abortion in this country, are a federal competence, not a provincial one. It's, it's, it's okay to be worried, but it's good to be aware of basic political facts. Yes. Althea. Okay, I want to come back to something that Chantal said. She said that nothing happened under Stephen Harper, and she's right that no, like, no law has changed, but that did not mean that some conservative MPs did not try to push forward the issue, which they continue to do after he left. And I, I think that that is significant to mention, whether it was Stephen Woodward's motion on when life begins or uh, the latest uh, effort to ban sex-selective abortions. Um, the pro-life movement in this country, their goal is to elect as many conservative MPs who are anti-abortion as they can. And if you have a leader whose only pledge is, I will not introduce a government bill that will restrict abortion, but allows their backbench to introduce legislation and to have a free vote on this issue, there is the real possibility that if you have a majority government with an overwhelming majority of anti-abortion MPs, that you could have changes uh, to the abor to abortion rights in this country. Uh, Andrew, and I'll come back to you, uh, Chantel. Yep. Well, we're different societies between Canada and the United States with different political values and different institutional structures, as Chantal alluded to, or I'll flip it around. In the United States, the criminal law is is you know generally more on the state side than the federal side. There's only a short list of federal uh, crimes. Um, so if you even if you can't win a majority for an abortion law federally in the United States, you can impose it pro at the state level. In Canada, you'd have to get a majority in the in at the federal level, which is much harder to do. Supposing the, the most extreme possible scenario, because remember, not only does it have to pass the House of Commons, it would have to get through the Supreme Court. And it's very hard to see what kind of abortion law could get past the Supreme Court. But supposing there were something, supposing uh, in the most extreme possible scenario, uh, you banned abortion in the third trimester. That's basically the Roe v. Wade rule. L l last word to you, Chantal, then I'll take a break. It has been my experience that the best way to deal with arguments, and this is a serious argument, is to allow people on both sides of the debate to have their say in the House of Commons. That is what Parliament is about. And I read some of the coverage, and I worry uh, that suddenly people who have a different opinion should not be MPs, or that MPs who are anti-abortion, and there are 40 of them, or almost, uh, in the Conservative caucus, uh, should somehow not exist. 
And I don't think that serves politics well or that it serves the pro-abortion position uh, that it does not get its tires kicked uh, regularly. Okay, thank you for that. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more at issue and a look at the early days of the Ontario election. There's a real momentum. I feel that momentum out there anywhere I go. So what does that momentum mean? Does it exist for the ballot box? That's next. Nice. There's a real momentum. I feel that momentum out there. Anywhere I go, I can feel it and people are excited. They're pumped up. People are out there and ready to go. Doug Ford kicked off his campaign earlier earlier this week. Ontarians are going to head to the polls on June 2nd. So how is he positioning himself for re-election after four years in power? Where do the opposition party stand? Chantal, Andrew, and Althea back for one other round of At Issue. Andrew, uh, it seems Doug Ford is, is leading in the polls. Um, what do you make of how he's framing himself and, and his pitch to people in Ontario? In 2018, the Conservatives, I think you could say, won in spite of Doug Ford rather than because of him. Uh, arguably, they would have had an even bigger majority with Christine Elliott. I think you could say this time, they, if they do win, it will be in large part because of him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, he has, uh, by many accounts, has grown in the job. I don't want to overstate that. Uh, we're setting the bar pretty low. But he is much more identifiably a mainstream politician than he was when he started. Uh, I think there's some lessons in that for the federal conservatives, uh, mm. that if he does win, as the polls would indicate at this point, um, he will have done what the federal conservatives have been unable to do election after election. Uh, and that is to say that to tap into the mainstream voter by behaving more like a recognizable adult. Uh, so that, I think, is the biggest significance, at least for the federal scene in this. Um, Althea, what, what do you make of how Ford's positioning himself? And I guess we should also say his opponents, who I think are having still a hard time uh, fighting back against Doug Ford and his brand. And maybe differentiating themselves from each other. Yeah. I mean, I think part of what we're going to be watching for in this contest is who becomes the voice for progressive voters, whether uh, former Brits rally to the new liberal leader, who's really rather unknown to most Ontarians, Stephen Dilduka, or if, um, you know, Andrew Horvath becomes the uh, the voice of uh, center left voters. I think it's really interesting to look back at how far <laughs> Doug Ford has gone. Like before the pandemic, he was tanking in the polls. Uh, it was mm -hmm. it was really incredible, frankly, the the pivot that he has been able to do, and the the fact that he's basically now running not as a hard right populist conservative leader, but as a centrist candidate. And and the, the pandemic management seems to have sort of worn, worn away, Chantal. It doesn't seem to be dragging Doug Ford, at least at this stage. Or at least uh, maybe it has saved them. If you look at this popularity, it was down in the basement before the pandemic and rose uh, consistently over the course of that. I've covered a lot of Ontario elections and too many <laughs> to say on the first week that I know how it's going to end on yep, the, sure. the last week and what lessons the federal conservatives should take. Uh, be, I was there for the Bob Ray election. For those who don't remember, David Peterson, the incumbent, started off at 55 percent. And the result was a majority NDP government. So Ontario mm -hmm. does things. Uh, but I think from a federal standpoint, what's most interesting is to how the Trudeau Liberals would probably be happier with Doug Ford's re-election than they will or would be with François Legault's re-election in Quebec in the fall. Mm -hmm. And that, that kind of coalition, or I think some people called it a bromance this week, Andrew, raised, I guess, a little bit of eyebrows. But as Chantal points out, you, you can see the political advantage for both of them in that. Yes, you you look bipartisan. Uh, you you never look bad as a politician when you're when you're handing out money, uh, and it may be an indication that the, the liberals uh, uh, have handicapped this race, that they think Ford's going to win, so they might as well um, get in good with the guy who's going to win. Althea, I think they just genuinely have a good working relationship. They are um, simpatico on the same priorities namely bringing um, electric vehicle production to Ontario. <laughs> They've spent billions of dollars now. Yeah. Like There's so many announcements uh, with Justin Trudeau and Doug Ford, and it's, the cabinet ministers have good relationships. I mean, I think 
Um, you know, another example is the fact that the Liberals were willing to ink a deal on childcare just before yes. um, the election, despite the fact a lot of Ontario Liberals would have wished that they would have waited until after the contest was over. The federal government decided to do, I think, frankly, what is right um, and, and negotiate this as, as soon as they were able to, rather than hold off for partisan reasons. But I do think it speaks to them choosing to um, to govern rather than to play politics. Okay, thank you all for uh, two good conversations, appreciate it. And now I'll throw things back to Adrian in Toronto. Thanks, Rosie. Coming up, a doctor's gift to her dying patient. But I hardly know this beauty by my side. A delayed concert becomes a private serenade and a moment that matters, plus. All right, just a good game on the courts or maybe a public nuisance? Next. Welcome back. Of all the ways life has changed since the pandemic, few could have predicted the explosion in popularity of pickleball. As Dan Bird explains, even if you've never heard of it, you may be hearing the game itself being played all too soon. It's sweaty, it's social, and it's noisy. Pickleball is a bit like tennis, but instead of a racket, uses a paddle and a hard ball. That's what makes it so loud. This is an indoor facility, but most pickleballers play outside, on tennis courts, near neighbors. We woke up Saturday morning going, what the hell? Connie Ball lives close to pickleball courts. It's just invading, right? And it goes right into, into our home. The space was repurposed for the growing pickleballer population, but noise complaints have reduced hours of play. Some players feel squeezed. This is the only court in Coquitlam where you can't play from 12 to 1. You can play tennis, you can do anything on here, but you can't play pickleball. That battle for court space is playing out across the region. Pickleball organizers are trying to find a balance. Noise, um, land value, and la land availability um, are going to be, uh, need to be taken into consideration. In Vancouver alone, the city is looking at converting at least a dozen tennis courts to pickleball, but officials say noise levels will be taken into consideration. Pickleball dates back to the 1970s. Its popularity has surged in recent years, and the pandemic has prompted even more people to pick up a paddle. Uh, the Ipsos survey indicates there's probably 900,000 households playing pickleball in Canada. Many of those households would have more than one person playing. That's up from an estimated 350,000 two years ago. So why is this game so enticing? It's, it's an easy sport to learn. Canada's top-ranked player agrees it brings people together. With pickleball, I find I can get uh, four beginners on a court that haven't even touched a paddle and have them playing within five to ten minutes. A game that's proved to be a hit for many wherever they can find space to play. Dan Burrett, CBC News, Surrey. An Ottawa woman had a dying wish to see her favorite singer. Instead, he came to her. But I hardly know this beauty by my side. That private concert is our moment. Next. Chris DeBerg, he was set to perform in Ottawa last April, but his concert was delayed because of COVID until next year. And for one fan, that meant she will likely never get to see him again. That is because Christina Vernon has been told she has months left to live. She's been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, so her palliative care doctor found a way to bring the concert to her, and that's our moment. This beauty by my side. Hello, Christina. My name is Christa Berg. He sings a song or two for me, and it's just wonderful. I'll never forget the way you look tonight. Dr. Wetter warms my heart. I'm so lucky to have her. Her reaching out to Christa Berg, I don't have enough words to say thank you. And with a swing of That was to what she needed. 
and I knew it would mean the world to her. I don't cry easily and I cried during that video because it was just so personal. So knowing what's important and valuable to her helps me to give her the best part of this journey that, that she can have. She's helping me to find it to be okay. I mean, it's normal. Death is part of life. We're yelling out for more. I kind of get to go out in a way that I didn't plan, but I'm going to have fun while I'm doing it. Christina, you are amazing, surrounded by good doctors, good people, a great perspective. We wish you all the best. That is a national for May the 5th tonight.